While waking up, you hear that an intruder has entered your home. Your instinctual reaction is to jump up out of your bed, just to make the frightening discovery that you're paralyzed. You feel an intense panic before you snap out of it and awaken for real. Your ability to move has returned and you realize that no one is in your home. What you have just experienced is sleep paralysis. Welcome to the neuroscience of dreams. Sleep paralysis refers to the inability to move during sleep or while in a state of awakening. Although inhibited movement during sleep, also referred to as atonia, is common, the term sleep paralysis is often exclusively used for the particular occasion when people wake up and actually experience this paralysis. Estimates vary greatly, but it is thought that somewhere between 10 and 50% of people will experience sleep paralysis episodes at least once in their lifetime. Around 5% of people have regular sleep paralysis experiences. Historical paintings and folklore emphasize that sleep paralysis has been around for hundreds or even thousands of years. Yet, despite its prevalence and historical recognition, scientific understanding of this phenomenon is very limited. Most of what we know about sleep paralysis comes from anecdotal evidence, combined with some correlational analyses of health, lifestyle and comorbidity factors. Nevertheless, there are a handful of studies that attempted to investigate this phenomenon objectively by measuring brain activity. Let's dive into what we know about the terrifying experience of sleep paralysis. What actually is sleep paralysis? Is it a dream? Meaning that you are asleep and you experience some kind of realistic lucid nightmare? Or is it a hallucination, meaning you are awake, yet you have fictitious experiences? Well, there is no clear-cut answer. Previous studies have suggested that sleep paralysis is a combination between a wakeful state and a sleep state. A large portion of scientific literature seems to prefer the term hallucinations over dream. Yet this is not universally true. Indeed, a recent study provided evidence for it being a dreamlike state, similar to lucid dreaming. Some scientific papers circumvent this nomenclature problem by opting for the word phenomenon. Also, whether sleep paralysis is best described as a dream or a hallucination seems to depend on a specific sleep paralysis event. We will discuss this topic a little later. First, let us define what kind of sleep paralysis experiences exist. Although each sleep paralysis experience is different, episodes can be broadly categorized into one out of four categories. Three categories include hallucinations of dreamlike experiences, whereas the last is not accompanied by any altered reality. The three hallucination types are called the intruder hallucination, the incubus hallucination and the vestibular motor hallucination. First, there is the intruder hallucination, on which our introductory story was based. This type of sleep paralysis often involves experiencing the room around while lying in bed and a frightful experience happens. This can, as the name suggests, be the experience of an intruder, but it could also be the experience of an animal, a ghost, fire or flooding. In some cases, people report their eyes are open, which means it fits best to the term hallucination. During the intruder hallucination, there is a realistic feeling of being in bed, in the exact position that you actually are. Yet anecdotal evidence suggests that some individuals who experience this type of sleep paralysis open their eyes when snapping out of the episode. This suggests that, at least in some individuals, eyes are only half open or even fully closed and that there is only an apparent state of wakefulness. The second category 
of sleep paralysis experiences is known as the incubus hallucination. With this type, someone experiences not only a full paralysis, but also pressure on the chest or a feeling of choking or suffocating. The name incubus refers to a mythical demon, and indeed, incubus hallucinations are often accompanied by experiences of a ghost, a demon, or other spiritual entities. These demonic entities are the direct experienced cause for the feeling of suffocating as they sit on the chest or the throat. Given the proximity of the hallucinated foe and the experiences of life threat, incubus hallucinations are experienced as extremely terrifying, with people being in a state of high distress and fear after awakening. Then there are vestibular motor hallucinations, where someone experiences some kind of illusory, uncontrollable movement while awakening. With vestibular motor hallucinations, a person often has the conscious feeling of just waking up, feeling stuck and unable to move. These experiences can be in-body or out-of-body. An example of an in-body vestibular motor experience is the feeling of extremely slow and sluggish twisting of the body with no apparent control. One may experience the lower body turning while their upper body is fully paralyzed which leaves one with the feeling of a very uncomfortable position with no ability to get out of it. In actuality, the body has not moved at all. Then there are out-of-body experiences, where someone experiences seeing their body from the outside, often floating above it. These hallucinations can be, but are not necessarily, accompanied by visual experiences of the surroundings. As such, more often than not, no hallucinations of external threats, such as an intruder or a ghost, are perceived. Next to these three forms of sleep paralysis hallucinations, another event may occur that is neither a dream nor a hallucination. In this type, people feel awake with closed eyes, yet feel that they are unable to move. No visual, auditory, vestibular or motor hallucinations occur, and the main annoyance is the inability to open the eyes. This type is most common in people that regularly experience sleep paralysis phenomena. They tend to be highly aware of the situation and fully understand that they are currently experiencing a sleep paralysis episode. Although still uncomfortable, the clarity and understanding of the situation and the absence of other frightening hallucinations makes this type more annoying than frightening. Now, the four sleep paralysis phenomena are moderately to highly correlated, meaning that someone who has regular experiences may encounter any sleep paralysis type at any time. Moreover, the hallucination states may transition into one another. Something that starts as a non-hallucinatory inability to move may transition into an intruder hallucination. This is why people who experience regular events still like to escape the situation as soon as possible. A few research studies have correlated occurrences of sleep paralysis phenomena with regular lucid dreaming. Yet the relationship does seem to be quite weak, meaning that somebody who suffers from sleep paralysis does not regularly experience lucid dreaming. Having said that, there are reports that do show a link between sleep paralysis and false awakenings, where somebody seems to start their usual morning routine just to wake up again and figure out that everything they did was not real. Even transitions from sleep paralysis into false awakenings have been reported. Since false awakenings are considered a dream state, the question whether sleep paralysis is a dream or a hallucination just seems to get even more complex. Very little neuroscience experimental observations on sleep paralysis have been documented. The reason is simple. Sleep paralysis events are rare and unpredictable. Nevertheless, there are a handful of amazing studies that need to be discussed. Golden standard for scientific sleep research is the polysomnograph, which is the recording 
of electroencephalography, or EEG, during sleep. This research has identified that sleep can be categorized into four stages of non-REM sleep, where there are no eye movements. Stage 1 to 4 reflect light to deep sleep. Stage 1 light sleep is categorized by relatively slow, so-called theta waves in the EEG. This is also described as a state of drowsiness and occurs when someone falls asleep or is just waking up. Stage 4 deep sleep is reflected by very large and very slow delta waves. Besides those four, there is another stage, which is the so-called REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep stage. Here, eyes move from side to side. The EEG during REM sleep kind of resembles the activity you would see when somebody is awake. And you can observe theta and even fast beta waves. Although dreaming occurs frequently during REM sleep, it can also occur during non-REM sleep. Interestingly, muscle activity has been recorded during sleep using electromyography or EMG. REM sleep often coincides with atonia, which is a temporary paralysis of the muscles. It is this exact atonia that somebody consciously experiences during a sleep paralysis event. This shows that the perceived paralysis is not just made up. So why does our brain decide to paralyze our body during REM sleep? It has been suggested that this prevents us from making haphazard movements during dreaming. From an evolutionary perspective, this would be advantageous, since it allowed our ancestors to sleep in trees without falling out of them. Recently, evidence from animal studies has shown that inhibitory glycine GABA neurons in the ventromedial medulla which is a region in the brainstem, are the most likely candidate to cause atonia during REM sleep. So our brain paralyzes us during dreaming, yet most people are not aware of it. But what happens in people that actually experience paralysis consciously? One study involving 16 participants attempted to artificially induce sleep paralysis. The participants went to sleep and researchers woke them up at the end of a non-REM sleep period, after which they had to do a short attention task. After this task, participants went back to sleep. And since sleep stages are quite regular, it was thought that they would start the second sleep cycle in the REM sleep stage. This means, when falling asleep, there would be a transition from wakefulness immediately into a dream state. By using this method, Researchers were able to induce six sleep paralysis events, and five out of those six events were accompanied by distressing hallucinations. Participants afterwards reported being unable to move, which was confirmed by flatlined EMG, indicating muscle atonia. The EEG brain activity during sleep paralysis was very unique and indicated two stages at once. They observed typical REM sleep activity as well as clear alpha activity, which is associated with a relaxed but awake state and not with REM sleep. This suggested that participants were awake and in REM sleep at the same time. An even more amazing observation was made in two participants, where the occurrence of alpha activity seemed to disrupt rapid eye movements. Researchers interpreted these observations as participants looking at something during a hallucination. Interestingly, recently, another study has provided more data. The study described EEG-related activity during five sleep paralysis events in another group of people. These sleep paralysis events were not forced, but reflected spontaneous events picked up during long-term recordings of patients with sleep-related issues such as narcolepsy and sleep apnea. Their EEG analysis showed something very similar as to what the previous study found. They observed an average signal that is halfway in between an awake state and a REM sleep state. There was a small amount of alpha activity, less than during wakefulness, but more than during REM sleep. Other slow wave activity, reflecting a sleep stage, was observed as well. Now, the results of the two studies differ slightly, as the first describes a summation of two state signals, whereas the other describes an average of two state signals. Nevertheless, both studies agree that sleep paralysis reflects an intermediate state 
between REM sleep and wakefulness. Interestingly, despite the similarity in findings, the second study describes sleep paralysis as a dream state, which is in contrast to the first study describing it as a hallucination. Now, a word of caution is necessary when interpreting these results. Across the two studies, we have electrophysiological recordings of a total of 11 sleep paralysis events. Yet, anecdotal evidence shows an enormous range of different experiences that people have. As such, it is very likely that both studies describe slightly different types of events. Some events may be more related to a dream state, whereas other events are probably better described as an hallucination. What is certain is that the perceived paralysis is real and that the brain is in a stage somewhere between awakening and being in REM sleep. So can we say anything about brain structures that are involved? Well, studies on hallucinations in patients suffering from schizophrenia point towards activity in the parietal and visual cortex. Additionally, medial prefrontal and limbic areas, such as the amygdala, seem to be related to the emotional and particularly the fear responses of hallucinations. Whether this can be related to sleep paralysis events remains uncertain. However, the amygdala has also been suggested to be activated during the induction of fear in nightmares. Concerning the vestibular motor hallucinations, the posterior cingulate cortex is suggested to play a role, as it has been linked to self-location and body ownership. Also, the temporal parietal junction has been suggested to be related to out-of-body experiences. So this region may potentially be related to these kinds of hallucinations. Currently, very little is known about the factors that can explain sleep paralysis, and it is almost impossible to predict. As mentioned before, a potential link may exist between lucid dreaming, false awakenings and sleep paralysis. Additionally, occurrence of sleep paralysis seems to occur more often in people who suffer from narcolepsy. On top of that, a genetic study of 862 twin siblings whose sleep patterns were known suggested that polymorphisms in the PER2 gene may be associated with sleep paralysis. This suggests that sleep paralysis is likely hereditary, although the observed correlation was not very strong and needs to be confirmed by future studies. Other factors such as sleep quality, stress and the general health status seem to be correlated to occurrences of sleep paralysis as well. Again though, these correlations are quite weak. It has also been suggested that external factors such as room luminance or temperature may increase the likelihood of sleep paralysis events in people who experience them regularly. Some studies have investigated other factors that do not seem to be related to sleep paralysis. For example, there seems to be no link between sleep paralysis and gender or age or ethnicity. Maybe more astonishingly, caffeine, which can have a negative effect on sleep generally, does not seem to be related to sleep paralysis events. So for all coffee drinkers out there, no worries. Previously, I mentioned a potential link between sleep paralysis and false awakenings. False awakenings typically don't induce as much fear as a sleep paralysis event, yet they can be incredibly confusing. When trapped in a false awakening loop, one can have the feeling of waking up three, four, five or even more times, eventually ending up perplexed whether one is awake or not. Therefore, in the next episode we will take a deeper look in this bizarre phenomenon. Until then, we hope to see you the next time.